I remember saying one time, uh, come in next week and we're going to do the testimony. Then I turned around at the end of the message and say, if you want to know the rest of the story, you have to come back. Uh, and we're going to take that to the end of today. <laughs> you know, at the end of November in the church year is the Advent. <clears throat> I venture to say that we, we do celebrate Christmas on the 25th of December. Uh, there's all kinds of reason to believe that that was not really the day that Christ was born, but it's the day the church do celebrate it. And Exodus is where most of this story is, except for when, Noah, when Moses was not allowed to cross with the families, when God kind of punished him. That's in Numbers, the 20th chapter. Exodus, read with me, 5th chapter, 1 through 11. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival for me in the desert. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and foremen in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go gather their own straw but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the men so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Then the slave drivers and the foremen went out and said to the people, this is what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. The Passover. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the spirit that endows all believers. We ask that you continue to speak to our minds with your thoughts that we would set aside ourselves and we would listen in accordance with your will. It is in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Now we know that Moses was a special child. And I have to always go back to the Ten Commandment movie because it is imprinted on a lot of people and many people think that that movie is like the Bible and it's not. It's a fantastic movie. I've seen it many, many times. It's showing now, Technicolor, even when you look at it, it's beautiful, but it's a movie. Moses was a special child, and God protected Moses through everything from birth on. God protected Moses. <coughs> and Joseph is long dead. 400 years or more. And the Egyptians, same Egyptians today, had grown to fear the Hebrew slaves because they multiplied so fast. And Pharaoh told the midwives to kill the babies, the boy babies. But the midwives wouldn't listen to that. They listened to God. And Pharaoh finally ordered the soldiers to throw the baby boy babies into the Nile River and let the crocodiles feed on them. 
And Pharaoh's daughter took Moses from the river and gave him his name. And now we're fast forward. You know, Moses and killed an Egyptian and he, he's and run away and he's in Midian. He's a shepherd with Jethro, a Midianite priest. And it's now during the conversation between Moses and God at the burning bush. Exodus, the third chapter, 1 through 12. Read with me. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptian and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezrites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign for you. Let me read that again. I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And you know, we just read last Sunday how Moses was well learned in Egypt. He learned all the trades and everything about it. But now he's, he, he really don't want this mission. He don't want to do this. So he's offering all kinds of things. And I haven't read the whole story, but you know, he told God, I'm not a good spokesman. I'm not this and I'm not that. And God said, Aaron is on his way to see you. Aaron will speak for you. And God told Moses how he planned to use him to get the Hebrews released from bondage. He's now commissioned by God. He and Aaron is going to see Pharaoh and do what God told him to do. This is after all those little arguments back and forward. God turned his stick to a snake and all those kind of things. <clears throat> Moses went to Pharaoh and he demanded in the name of the God of Israel that he let the people go. Who is this God that I must obey? You know, Pharaoh probably thought of himself as a God. This demand to let Israel go came from God. And we're talking the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Israel was a national tribal identity. And to recognize the God of Israel means that we would acknowledge the slaves had an identity. They were not just anybody. 
And instead, Pharaoh's response was of arrogance. I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Now, you know, if you read that story, God also told him that he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh will not let him go. God was going to see to that. Pharaoh was telling the truth. He did not know God, the God of Abraham, Isaac. But this is about to change. And he couldn't comprehend Moses' experience. He couldn't even imagine what Moses experienced. And he tried to find a reason to explain it. And his assumption was that they didn't have enough work. The slaves didn't have enough work to do. He increased their labor. See, they were bringing the straw to him. You need straw to make the bricks. And now you will maintain the same tally, but we will not bring the straw. You get your own straw. But you remember, God told Moses that he would harden Pharaoh's heart and he would refuse to let Israel go. And it happened just like God said, just like God had told him it was going to happen. So Moses was well read into it. But it was bad for Moses. It must have been bad. Pharaoh would not listen. Moses felt that he had not helped the situation at all. Romans, the ninth chapter, 14 to 18. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. God was making an example out of Pharaoh. You've talked all this talk, but I'm the real God, Yahweh. There's no other God. You can do anything you want to. And we was talking uh, earlier today, you know, going to church don't make you a Christian. No more than going to McDonald's make you a hamburger. You can go to church every day and bust hell wide open. Not here. Other churches, maybe. Huh? One of Satan's ploys is to create dissension amongst God's people. He wants to create confusion. That's still the charge today. And he's very effective at it. Why? Because Satan plays on our weaknesses. And we all have weaknesses. Every one of us have a weakness. There's something. And whatever that weakness is, when you claim God, Satan dangles it in front of you every day of your life. Amen. We can only witness that ourselves because we're the only ones who know who the, what the weakness is, is. But if your weakness is Good looking men, God will put Charles Atlas in front of you in one way and Satan will use it in another. If your weakness is alcohol, you know the rest of the deal. That's still it. When there's strife and discord, Satan is always at the bottom of the pile. You can find him. The enemy was Pharaoh, but the leaders of Israel turned on Moses. One of the risks of leadership is that when things go wrong, the blame is usually put on the leader. Moses did not lose faith because he took questions directly to God. Moses talked directly to God. And God said to Moses, now you will see what I'll do to Pharaoh. 
Don't you know who I am, Moses? Don't you remember? I am that I am. I am Yahweh. I'm the one who is. And I took you for my people. And I alone will be your God. Go to Pharaoh again. And tell him to let my people go. This marks the first confrontation between God and the gods of Egypt. No nation in the world, ancient world, had as many gods as Egypt. It's still kind of like that today. The plagues that came upon Egypt, they were not God doing tricks like the Ten Commandments was showing it. God's doing that. No. These plagues were direct confrontation between the God of Israel and the gods of Egypt. In the beginning, the leaders of Egypt took the matter lightly. They didn't take it seriously. Their magicians duplicated several of the miracles Moses produced with his staff. And one of the chief gods in Egypt was the Nile River. Very little rainfall. Without the Nile, there would be no Egypt. They depended on the Nile for water. And God wanted to teach a lesson that they would never forget, beginning with the Nile River. The plagues that came upon Egypt Frogs, lice, flies, pestilence, that, that diseased cattle, boils, warts, hail, locusts, and darkness. The Bible said God caused the darkness to fall on the land for three days. A darkness that could be felt but there was light in Goshen. You know, I, I told this story before, but I'll tell it again. I, I wanted to experience what it felt like to not, to hold your hand in front of you and not be able to see it. And I got in the ISO shelter out at Depth Meds. And if you close the door of ISO shelter, you know, that's the surgical part. Yeah. You close the door of that shelter, you put your hand in front of you, you can't see it. You have to reach out and touch it to know it's there. A darkness that could be felt, but it was light in Goshen. Beginning with the plague of the flies and onward, they never affected the Hebrews in the land of Goshen. All this stuff was going on across the street, if you will. But it wasn't happening in Goshen. Look at Exodus 8, chapter 20, verse. You don't make this up. Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes to the water and say to him, This is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials and on your people into their your houses. The houses of the Egyptian will be full of flies and even the ground where they are. Look at verse 22. But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarm of flies will be there. So you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This miraculous sign will occur tomorrow. And that would be the last day of their slavery. They were about to go free. They go away. The time is about midnight. God set them up in such a way where the Egyptians gave them gold. You, you read that whole story. They gave them monies to take with them. Midnight, the very next night. This is the time of night when all would be sleep. All firstborn 
of livestock and people will sleep the sleep of death, man and beast, not silently so that is not to be discovered until morning, but to wake up the families in the mid midnight and they will stand by and see them die. The prince to succeed on the throne was not too high to be re reached, nor were the slaves at the mill too low. Everyone will be affected by this one last plague. All firstborn. The only exception was those who were covered by the blood of the Lamb. The blood would be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. It had to be a perfect Lamb. It's a symbiotic of Jesus Christ. A perfect Lamb. Christ was perfect. The only perfect being. We're all flaky. <laughs> but Christ was perfect. Without sin. This is a Passover. Exodus. We're almost done. And we need to set that clock back there too. Because the clock has never been changed. I wonder how many of us woke up wrong. And didn't sleep the extra hour. And all that kind of stuff. Rushing and didn't turn it back. Exodus 12 chapter. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with each person, what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be a year old male without defect. You may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lamb. That same night there to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, inner part. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some of it is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it with your cloak tucked to your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. This time... Neither Moses or Aaron were ordered to summon this plague. I will go out, said God, Yahweh, while angels drew their swords against the Egyptians. Exodus 11, 7, we're almost there. But amongst the Israelites, not a dog will bark or any man or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and in Israel. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. You know, I have to think that there were good Egyptians too. And maybe some of them was in the houses with Israel. 
That's just me. The Bible doesn't say that. How does this apply to us today? Hebrews, the ninth chapter, 11 through 15, and then we'll skip to 24. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of blood of goats and calves. He entered by the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. His blood, the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself unblemished to God, Cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we might serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised inheritance, eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Skip down to 24. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest entered the most holy places every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have suffered many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Christ is the final sacrifice. And we're under that dispensation. It's not going to be any more things. He's not going to offer anything. You accept Christ or you don't. That's the last thing that Christ, God, is going to do. That we're under Jesus Christ. We don't have to offer our sons and daughters just believe that God offered his, Amen. that we'd be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our salvation. Bless the families today. Open their hearts and their ears to you, that we would go safely. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Let the church say amen.